This video is supported by Lumerit Scholar. There's a term being thrown around a lot these days. It's called new space. This is the new paradigm of private commercial space flight companies that are opening up a whole new industry for satellite technology. On this channel, I've covered SpaceX quite a bit and Blue Origin, both of which are companies that are using reusability as a way of bringing down the cost per kilogram of uh, satellite launches. And this has led to a trend of bigger and bigger rockets that can launch more and more satellites per launch. And some of the planned rockets are actually the biggest rockets ever designed. And the strategy makes sense, but generally technology tends to trend the other way. It gets smaller and smaller over time. Microchips, for example, or cell phones are a great example. They got smaller and smaller over a couple of decades until we realized that we could watch porn on them, and then suddenly the screens got magically bigger. And a similar trend is happening with satellite technology as CubeSats and microsatellites are becoming more and more useful and in demand. And yeah, you do still have the big, you know, research satellites like the James Webb and stuff like that, but the general trend is towards smaller constellations of satellites. So on one hand, you have satellites getting smaller and smaller, and on the other hand, you have rockets getting bigger and bigger. Shouldn't there be a smaller, more affordable launch option to accommodate these smaller satellites? There is. It's a company called Rocket Lab, and their orbital electron rocket is making space open for business. Let's face it, we like to go big. We love the superlatives. Bigger is better, especially here in America. But sometimes it's the smallest things that make the biggest difference. The Volkswagen Beetle is a great example. The Beetle came out in the 50s when most cars were hulking land yachts, and their groundbreaking Think Small ad campaign helped to create a market for fun, affordable cars that democratized the road. Anybody could afford a Beetle. My first car actually was a 74 Beetle, and I put this gigantic speaker system in the back, and I called it the Basic Nugan. Because I was so clever. Similarly, Rocket Lab is democratizing space with small, fun, affordable rockets that make it possible for anybody to harness the power of satellite technology to innovate and change the world. This is a big deal. Rocket Lab was founded in 2006 by rocket engineer and entrepreneur Peter Beck, with the idea being that he wanted to make spaceflight cheaper and available to everyone. The opportunity to, um, you know, to do what we're, we're doing with the Electron program was always very obvious to me that spacecraft we're going to follow Moore's law and we're going to shrink. Mm. And, um, you know, large LEO constellations make a lot of sense. I think you reach a tipping point with technology and information. Uh, you know, it's probably no different to the aviation industry where it was, was governments and, and large corporations and then uh, it became much, much more feasible uh, to disseminate that down. Um, you know, it used to be governments built planes, not companies. And uh, it's the same with, with space launch vehicles now is, is it's no longer governments building space launch vehicles, it's companies. By the way, I had the pleasure of interviewing Peter Beck for the podcast, as you just saw. I'll be using clips from it here in this video. But if you want to check out the entire interview, which I highly recommend, we covered all kinds of cool topics. I'll put a link right here, or there's a link down in the description. Definitely go check that out. Rocket Lab is based out of New Zealand, but has facilities in Los Angeles as well. One of their guiding principles to cut down on costs is to make everything themselves and own all the infrastructure. So they built their own launch complex on the Mahaya Peninsula in New Zealand, which has easily got to be the most gorgeous launch site in the world. It's also the only privately owned launch facility in the world and the first one in the Southern Hemisphere. Although they did make a deal with NASA to launch out of Cape Canaveral because some orbital trajectories need to be launched from closer to the equator than they are. Their goal is to launch satellites for as low as $5 million, but instead of focusing on reusability like Blue Origin and SpaceX, they're focusing on making small, powerful launch vehicles that are cheap and disposable. And they're innovating some revolutionary ideas to do so. The first rocket launched in 2009. It was a tiny sounding rocket called the Ateo-1. It was only six meters long and weighed 60 kilograms, but it did reach an altitude of 120 kilometers, which is above the Kármán line, so it officially got to space. And taking the lessons that they learned from that, they went all in on their flagship vehicle, the Electron rocket. And this is a lean, mean, badass orbital machine. The Electron is small but powerful. Standing only 17 meters tall compared to the Falcon 9 at 70, the Electron is a two-stage rocket capable of taking 225 kilometers to low Earth orbit. Now, when people are talking about the Falcon Heavy and the new Glenn launching over 50 tons into space, that doesn't sound very impressive. But as Peter Beck says in our interview, the payload capacity and the size that they chose was very deliberate and specific. Every year we, re we do a sort of a market sum up of all the spacecraft that were launched. And, you know, last year, out of all the spacecraft that were launched and put on orbit, we can fly 62% of them. <laughs> it's pretty so, good market. Yeah, I mean, and look, if we double the size of the rocket, we fly 64% of them. <laughs> so we're very you know, purposeful with that, you know, this, the, class of, the class of payload that, that we thought was going to be the sweet spot. 
The design of the Electron could almost be described as a tiny Falcon 9, with nine first stage Rutherford engines and one second stage vacuum engine. What are five things about the Rutherford engine? Well, I'm glad you asked. Let me tell you. Number one is named after New Zealand-born physicist Ernest Rutherford, who basically discovered the nucleus of the atom. Hey, you know what's also in the atom? An electron. Number two, it runs off of liquid oxygen and RP-1 fuel. This is pretty common for rockets, but it's the next few that get a little mind-blowing. Number three, it runs on batteries. I did not misspeak just now. The Rutherford is what's called a pump-fed engine. Basically, the fuel has to be at a certain pressure in the combustion chamber in order to work. And instead of making the tank completely pressurized, what it does is it takes a pump that pressurizes the fuel before it goes into the combustion chamber. And this is all well and good and not unusual amongst rocket engines, but with most rocket engines, they're gas-fed, meaning that there's a little turbine that fuels the pump. So it's basically a little engine that feeds the big engine. But the Rutherford engine uses a brushless DC electric motor powered by a lithium polymer battery. It kind of runs on electricity. You know what's also an electricity? An electron. The battery pack does add a little bit of extra dry weight to the vehicle, but the electric pump actually increases the efficiency from 50% to 95%. Like I said, small but powerful. It truly is the little engine that could. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. All right, yeah, I did that. I know, thank you. Hi, how's it going? What are you doing after the show? The fourth and possibly most amazing thing about the Rutherford engine, it's 3D printed. As Peter says in our interview, 3D printed parts are not that unusual for rockets these days, whether you're talking about the engine or other components of the rocket, but this Rutherford engine is fully 3D printed. It's fully 3D printed, all the turbo pumps, all the thrust chambers, injectors, everything's 3D printed in there. Even the, even the liquid oxygen and kerosene transfer pipes. But we started that and when, when 3D printers, you know, metallic 3D printers, we used to make bottle openers and kind of quirky little things yeah. to show it at trade shows, you know. And, um, and we're gonna make engines with that. Yeah, we'll, we'll just make a rocket engine with that. You know, yeah, the most look. highly stressed, uh, <laughs> mass, uh, mass sensitive um, right. piece of machinery you can make. Let's just do that. And because of this innovative manufacturing process, we get the fifth thing about the Rutherford engine they can build one in 24 hours. I'm posting this video on a Monday. By the time my Thursday video comes out, they could have made three Rutherford engines. That's insane. The entire rocket is carbon fiber construction, which is obviously very light and strong, but it's also really easy to construct, allowing for super fast production of rocket modules. Are you starting to get the picture here? Even the fuel tanks are made of carbon fiber, which have to be kept at an extremely low temperature, which was a massive engineering challenge and one of the reasons that it took several years for them to develop this. They also built their own computer and telemetry systems from scratch using a fiber optic platform, but perhaps the coolest thing about the Electron, in my opinion anyway, is a unique orbital injection module that they call the kick stage. The kick stage allows Rocket Lab to put multiple satellites in multiple orbits on the same flight. So if you have two satellites, say one that needs to orbit at 1,000 kilometers and the other one at 1,500 kilometers, the Electron second stage would release the primary payload at its 1,000 kilometer orbit, then release a secondary payload attached to the kick stage, which propels the payload to its proper orbit as the second stage falls back into the atmosphere. Once the kick stage releases a secondary payload, it also deorbits to reduce space debris. The kick stage is powered by the tiny 3D printed Curie engine, which is named after Mary Curie, and it also has its own power source, communication platform, and avionics system. The reason I think the kick stage might be the coolest thing about the Electron rocket is it dramatically increases the flexibility of their launches, allowing them to serve more customers every single launch. This is one of the things that's gonna make it successful. The first launch of the Electron was in May of 2017, and it was called It's a Test. It's a test made it to space, but they lost telemetry and had to destroy it for safety reasons, so it's generally considered to be a failure, although they did later determine that the cause of the problem was at the ground station and not with the rocket. The second launch of the Electron was called Still Testing, which launched in January of 2018. This one went flawlessly and actually carried three payloads into space, two CubeSats, and the Humanity Star satellite, which is a cool reflective geodesic sphere meant to reflect the sun's light like a giant disco ball in the sky as a gesture of global connection, encouraging people around the world to look up at the stars at the same time. They originally planned to do three launch tests, but still testing did so well that they decided to go ahead and open up the third one to commercial ventures, which they've named It's Business Time. It's business. It's business. 
time. It's business time was originally set to launch in April, but that date did get pushed back. We're looking at hopefully in the next month or so. Obviously when I find out, I will be updating the socials, so keep an eye out there. Their plan is to launch monthly by the end of 2018, every two weeks in 2019, and eventually get to the goal of launching every 72 hours. Luckily, they already have dozens of customers on their flight manifest, which just goes to prove their case that this was a market that needed to be served. And this is their plan, period. I asked Peter what their plan was after they reached their goal of $5 million per launch and 72 hour turnaround. And uh, this was his response. To be honest with you, I am contemplating on getting a tattoo across my forehead that says I'm <laughs> building a larger launch vehicle. <laughs> yeah, I think they're kind of done with that question. Look, SpaceX wants to get to Mars, and that's great. Blue Origin wants to get millions of people living and working in space, and that's great. Rocket Lab wants to open up space to entrepreneurs and innovators around the world. And you know what? That's great too. Because what they're doing is they're bringing satellite technology to the masses. They're democratizing space for the first time in history. Technologies only really take off when they're available to everyone. It's when you can access the ingenuity of billions of people that real change takes place. When the iPhone was created, it was just an iPod phone and internet communicator. In fact, that's exactly how Steve Jobs introduced it. An iPod, a phone, and an internet communicator. What really made the iPhone take off was the App Store. Once developers around the world got a hold of this tool and started developing apps for it, they came up with things that it could do that Steve Jobs could have never even dreamed of. The iPhone wasn't revolutionary as a phone. It was revolutionary as a platform. Rocket Lab is turning space itself into a platform, making it possible for developers and engineers to bring new ideas to life, ideas that are gonna change the world in ways that we can't even imagine now. For all the amazing things that this new space race is bringing us, it's this, the democratization of space that's gonna have the biggest impact on us here on Earth. And Rocket Lab is leading the way by thinking small. If you wanna make a career in this burgeoning industry, you gotta start with an education. Luckily, college degrees are really easy and super cheap. That's called a joke. As we all know, the price of a college degree is out of this world, pun intended, but it doesn't have to be, thanks to Lumerit.com. Lumerit is a smart way to plan for college, so you can graduate from the college of your choice with as little headache and expense as possible. Online colleges from around the world offer inexpensive credits so you can transfer to the college of your choice, but who has time to sort through all that? You tell Lumerit where you'd like to get your degree and they do the work for you and create a plan that get you there with transferable credits from less expensive online courses. And the transfers are guaranteed. It's like having a navigation system for your college degree. You can get a free quote if you go to lumerit.com slash answerswithjoe and maybe it'll save you some money. There's only one way to find out. Luckily, it's free. The average college graduate today enters the real world with nearly $40,000 in debt. That's absolutely ridiculous. Don't just accept this without checking out all the options. And Lumerit is one of those options. You owe it to yourself to check it out. So go to lumerit.com slash answers with Joe for a free quote, links down in the description. I wanna thank Lumerit for supporting this video and a big shout out to the Answer Files on Patreon who are helping to keep this whole thing afloat. I cannot thank you guys enough. It really does make all the difference in the world. So we have some new people that have joined us recently. I wanna call them out real quick. We've got Ishmael Haslam, uh, Glenn Holly, Wayne Bowers, J.R. Mitra, <laughs> Harry Dog Trumpet, uh, Hershey Spin, Skylar Dodds, and Brenda Miller. Thank you guys so much. If you would like to join them, get access to cool perks, including discounts on merchandise and videos that other people don't get to see, you can go to patreon.com slash answerswithjoe. Like and share this video if you liked it, and if this is your first time here, please check out some of my other videos, and if you like those, hit that subscribe button. You'll be first to see the new videos that come up every Monday and Thursday. Once again, I wanna give a big thank you to Peter Beck and Morgan Bailey and all the people at Rocket Lab who helped to make this video possible. Uh, please do go check out the podcast to get the full interview. We talk about a lot of really cool stuff. Peter is an awesome guy. Uh, links downstairs in the description. With that, you guys go out and have an eye-opening week and I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys, take care.